So our next speaker is Keelan Barcina. Keelan has a background working as a field researcher camping alongside Hawaiian monk seals, sea turtles, and a cacophony of nesting seabirds in the uninhabited and westernmost Hawaiian islands and the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. He says that on several nights, turtles nested next to his tent and began flying sand onto his tent walls. And it was those sleepless nights when Keelan pondered grad school. He came to this program to strengthen his science communication and broaden his perspectives on marine conservation so that he could effectively bridge communication gaps between science, management, and policy in the future. Acknowledging that environmental management is a multidisciplinary field, he was one of the few brave students this year who elected to take more than one economics course to build upon the interdisciplinary aspect of his studies here at Scripps. The title of Keelan's presentation today is Tide Pooling for a Solution, Strengthening Existing MPAs for Marine Resiliency in Pupukea. And Keelan will be joining us by Zoom today. Great. Thank you so much for your patience. Led by my mother's hand, I would cross the busy highway in front of my home as a child, and I would make my way down to the Pupukea tide pools. There, I found myself perusing the tide pools for craters much like this white-spotted sea cucumber, and I would translocate them to an area I thought safest for them. Now, I'm positive I had no lasting impacts on the ecology of the tide pools by rehoming these sea cucumbers, but my actions spoke to a deep sense of stewardship for these marine resources, and is what fostered my passion for marine conservation. It was my home that inspired me to take on a project that focuses on the very place that got me to where I am today. I'm excited to present to you today my capstone project, which takes a closer look at the tide pools I grew up exploring as a child. The Pupukea Tide Pools, also known as Kapo'o in Hawaiian, is located in Hawaii on the North Shore of Oahu. They can be found within the boundaries of the Pupukea Marine Life Conservation District that was designated nearly 40 years ago. And I grew up right there. Marine Life Conservation Districts, or MLCDs, are one form of marine protected areas in the state of Hawaii. Marine Life Conservation Districts are designed to conserve and replenish the marine life, but it also balances the needs of recreational fishermen um, and the general public. With this delicate balance, the Pupukea MLCD allows for limited fishing of certain areas during certain times of year and prohibits spearfishing and collecting uh, fish and uh, fish, coral, and shells. The Pupukea MLCD is one of 11 MLCDs in the state and one of three on the island of Oahu. And what makes Pupukea unique is that it is the only MLCD with a freshwater, major freshwater input from the Waimea River that feeds into Waimea Bay. And it's also the location of where the tide pools um, are located. Additionally, it's the second most popular snorkeling destination after the world famous Hanama Bay on Oahu's South Shore. And what's not pictured is that this area is also a part of the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary. The need for marine conservation districts comes from the pressure of a growing human population in Hawaii of both residents and visitors, which have adverse impacts on the near shore fish populations and coastal ecosystems. In 2009, Kapa'o became part of the greater Pupukea MLCD by executive orders signed by the governor of Hawaii. With this, the tide pools now fall under the jurisdiction of the state who enforces the rules of the MLCD through the Division of Conservation and Resource Enforcement. Though the tide pools have technically been a part of the Marine Life Conservation District for well over 10 years, the administrative rules of the MLCD still cannot be enforced to prohibit fishing and the take of marine life. Kapo is a culturally and biologically important place, and though we know the impacts from recreational human use, we don't fully understand the magnitude of these impacts. But fishing and the take of marine life cannot be legally enforced within the area. Therefore, the current administrative rules of the MLCD need to be amended so that the language of the rules explicitly include the tide pools and to increase marine resiliency in Pupukea. A word I want to define here is resiliency, and more specifically, ecological resiliency, which is the ability of an ecosystem to maintain key functions and processes in the face of stress or pressures by resisting and then adapting to change. For my project, there was no better organization than Malama Pupukea Waimea to partner with to advocate for the changing of the administrative rules to include the tide pools. 
Malama Pupu Kei Mea, or MPW, is a community nonprofit based on the North Shore of Oahu, whose mission is to replenish and sustain the natural and cultural resources of Pupu Kea through public outreach, education, and advocacy. There was a need within Malama Pupu Kei Mea to better understand the role of the tide pools within the Marine Life Conservation District by compiling, ex compiling existing scientific, culture and scientific and cultural research on the tide pools, Malama Pupuke Waimea could leverage this information to educate the public and support themselves through the rulemaking process. In partnership with the state of Hawaii's Division of Aquatic Resources who implements the rules. And this is where my project came into play. I want to know the current state of the literature around the Marine Life Conservation District as a whole and what role these tide pools played in Hawaii. To answer these questions, I synthesized and summarized all the relevant uh, scientific literature around the MLCD. I also had informal conversations with Malama Pupuke, Pupuke board staff and members um, about the cultural and historical significance of the area. And all of this came together. Uh, and secondly, I analyzed the recreational human use data collected by Malama Pupuke Waimea to see if there were trends in how people use the type over the years. This information I gathered and analyzed came together as a story map that I took on the form of an educational campaign and a strategic communication tool to reach stakeholders and policymakers. Today, I'm gonna to focus on my story map and the elements of the story map that really highlight uh, the, the information of why the Pupukea area and Kapo'o need protection. In our increasingly virtual world, story maps are the perfect educational tool to reach target audiences, such as tourists, fishermen, and those who may not be aware of the Marine Life Conservation District, and policymakers. Every year, Malama Pupuke Waimea performs, on average, 90 educational interventions and reports to enforcement 40 to 50 rule violations uh, that occur within the Pupuke MLCD. Most interventions occur during their weekly uh, educational outreach events. And the story map aims to expand the organization's reach to inform a broader audience about the importance of safeguarding Kapo'o until rule changes occur and to reduce violations in the area. The link to the story map can be disseminated in several ways. MPW can provide the link with the QR code to the story map on their webpage or social media platforms. The QR code can also be printed on outreach materials and signage found in the area. The story map also has the potential to reach lawmakers during the public hearing process when wanting, when changing, amending the rules to include Kapo'o. One important element of my story map was sharing the rich cultural history of Pupukea. Illustrated here are the traditional place names and cultural sites found in the Pupukea watershed. And to better acquaint you with this photo, Pupukea is located, or excuse me, the titles are located there. Kapo'o in Hawaiian means booming sound of the waves, and it likely gets its name from the winter swells that crash on the area, creating this booming sound. Fishes have always played a crucial role in the lifestyle of Hawaii's people by providing food. Early reports on fishing practices and marine fisheries in Hawaii reveal that people were subsistence living upon the land and using the marine resources of Pupukea. And it's likely that many of the residents of the area relied on a hole hole or Hawaiian flagtail as a food resource. In addition to the cultural importance, the typos host an array of marine life unique to the area that also makes it unique, significant. Kapo'o is outlined in red. It is approximately the size of 10 basketball courts and isn't your traditional tide pool because remnant pools are not left behind at low tide and that there's always a constant connection to the ocean. In my research, I found that there have only been two studies on Kapo'o. I found that there, uh, one was in 1975 and the second was in 2012 conducted by my capstone chair. They found that the tide pools are dominated by culturally important schools of Aholehole, which reveals that these fish are using the shallow water habitat of the tide pools for shelter and possibly as a nursery due to the observations of large school of juvenile fish. Local fishermen take advantage of the abundance of aholehole within the tide pools, knowing that the MLCD rules cannot be enforced. This is one example of how human use is impacting the resiliency of the tide pools. Another human use threat is the number of people recreating in the tide pools. Snorkelers and swimmers are notorious for inadvertently trampling over coral, algae, and other immobile marine life. Additionally, human presence can alter fish behavior and affect important life stages of marine life. In recent years, Hawaii's population has stabilized around 1.5 million people. And in 2019, nearly 10.5 million visitors visited the state of Hawaii, most of which visit the island of Oahu where Kapo'o is located. 
In comparison to 2009, that's nearly a 50% increase in visitors to Hawaii annually. And the majority of tourists participate in ocean-related activities, and with this, a likely increase of human pressure on marine resources. I was curious to know if Kapo'o was seeing more, visu- more visitors annually. So I took a closer look at, Hana- at the human use data collected by Malamo Pupukea Wanea. This data was collected at noon on most Saturdays of the year and represent a snapshot of the human use in Kapo'o. These data identify common use and change in recreational use over time. On the right, the average monthly number of people observed swimming, laying on the beach and snorkeling fluctuated between the years of 2017 and 2019, but the trend line suggests a positive increase in human use. At the end of 2019, an average of 190 people were in the tide pools on the weekends, which is up 132 people from 2010 when data collection first began. The unexpected COVID-19 pandemic was an opportunity to kilo or to observe and to watch closely uh, the tide pools in the absence of people. And during a two-month beach closure in response to the pandemic, there were observations of large schools of juvenile aholehole, the widespread growth of uh, native algae, guest appearances from species rarely seen in the tide pools, like this jeweled and enemy crab, and the use of kapo'o by shorebirds. All these things have not been seen in these numbers for years. This event shed light on the resiliency and the function of the tide pool as a refuge and a potential nursery for young marine life. Since we have an idea of what Kapo'o looks like under pre-COVID-19 conditions, this was a unique opportunity to help us understand what the ecosystem could look like without people and perhaps study the magnitude of impacts from recreational use on the tide pools. Kapo'o's Kapo'o's unique tide pool-like features and shallow water habitat is a home to a variety of marine life, including my childhood sea cucumbers. Its biological and cultural importance go hand in hand, and by not fully understanding the magnitude of recreational impacts in Kapo'o, we could potentially lose these resources. Because the administrative rules cannot be enforced in the tide pools, the lack of protection threatens Kapo'o's ability to recover from the stresses of fishing and potentially heavy human use. Moving forward, I'll continue to help Malama Pupuke Waimea fill its knowledge gaps related to the ecological role and function of Kapo'o and related to the impacts of recreational use on the ecosystem by uh, serving the biological community, environmental variables, and human use of the tide pools. This information will grow my story map into a product that will continue to raise awareness and educate the public on protecting the coastal waters of my community that brought me to where I am today. This project would not have been possible with my amazing capstone committee, um, composed of Dr. and Trump from Malama Pupukea Waimea, Heidi Batchelor from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and Dr. James Hilger from NOAA Southwest Fishery and Science Center. Special thanks to the MAS NBC program staff, as well as my 2020 cohort uh, that I wish I could be with today. Um, special thanks also to Malama Pupukea's board members and staff um, for their unwavering support, as well as my friends and family. Thank you. Thank you, Keelan. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Keelan? I'm open to any questions. Hi, Keelan. Just, oh yeah, I think we need to unmute. Great. Can you hear me now, Keelan? Hey, Samantha, I can hear you. Hey. All right, great job. So we've got a couple of questions. Um, what would be your top future research question to better understand the tide pools? That comes from Ann Chung in San Diego. Yeah, so I, I, it was a little fuzzy there. And I think the question was just sort of what is the top resource question that can better understand the tide pools? What would be your top future research question? Sure. Yeah, that's a really great question. I think a one of the number one research questions to better understand the function of the tide pools is to really confirm whether or not the tide pools uh, serve as a nursery. There's a lot of literature on the tide pools in Hawaii and how they do in fact serve as nurseries. Um, But most of these tide pools are basalt tide pools, whereas the kapo'o tide pools are actually a man-made feature uh, created by the dynamiting of the area in the early 1900s. So this is actually a submerged land area um, made of an ancient reef. Um, So yes, a lot of the features of Kapo'o align with that of a tide pool, but it's not fully understood whether or not it is serving as a nursery, though there's a lot of evidence suggesting that. So 
um, a top research question would be to identify really whether or not um, the, for example, uh, a hole hole that fish species, whether or not they're utilizing tide pools um, as juveniles, but also that, that the tide pool provides a nursery or a habitat for them to then recruit to deeper waters of the MLCD. Thank you for that. And Keelan, how do you plan to disseminate your story map to the different user groups you're trying to reach? How are you going to make sure that people see it? Yeah, that's also a really great question because there are so many different stakeholders, right? There are tourists, there are fishermen, and there's, there's the general public who are largely unaware that the area is a marine protected area. Um, and the best way to do this, um, I think, would be through social media platforms that Malama Pupukea has. Um, they have a really active presence on Facebook as well as Instagram. And as I mentioned, you know, in our increasingly virtual world, world content uh, on the internet is becoming more and more accessible. Um, in uh, regards to fishermen, fishermen, you know, sometimes could be older men who necessarily aren't on their phones all the time. Um, but with that, you know, they would see signage on the beach and potentially with the signage would be this information and the code uh, to the story map. Thank you so much, Keelan. We really appreciate you zooming in all the way from Hawaii to tell us about your project. So for Thank those so who are that. tuning in at home, we are going to go to our final break of the day, and we will reconvene at 4 o'clock with Allison Rowe. Thank you. <laughs>